Welcome back. So for our first real lecture of uh, our quantum mechanics class, I'm going to start where a lot of textbook starts, and I'm going to tell you about an experiment that helped us to understand why the quantum nature uh, of reality actually exists. But I'm going to tell the story in a little bit of a different way than most textbooks do. Most textbooks start by telling you what the answer was, but of course I like to think about science in a more uh, a more narrative fashion, right? When we when we have a scientific model, or when we have a when we have a model, we can just call it that. That model makes predictions, and then we go out and we use experiments to test whether those predictions are consistent with reality or inconsistent with reality. So when we look at the what's called the stern gallock experiment, the first thing that we want to ask ourselves is: Are these predictions from regular good old-fashioned classical physics, consistent with what we get out of, that, uh, out of that experiment. So in order to understand that, I think we need to take a moment and we need to actually talk about what that prediction was. Now, there are lots of good reasons for us to, uh, for us to know that, that particles, okay, and, and when I say particles here, I might mean electrons or I might mean atoms. Uh, maybe our experience in Physics 240 tells us that uh, we're really talking more about, uh, about uh, about atoms than we are electrons, but our experience with with these particles tell us that um, that many of these fundamental building blocks have permanent magnetic dipole moments. And I want you to think a little bit about what are, what is our evidence for uh, for atoms, say, having uh, permanent magnetic dipole moments. But there is good evidence that we talked about that we've talked about in previous classes. And so you might ask yourself, well. I know what these materials look like in bulk, right? I have a, a piece of material, right? And I can, I know by uh, taking measurements of that material that it's built up of things that have permanent uh, magnetic dipole moments. But maybe I want to measure what those magnetic dipole moments are, right? And so if I have a gas of atoms, I usually think about that gas of atoms as being made up of a bunch of these little dipole moments, and maybe they're, they're headed in all, of, all different directions, right? And so, say the magnetization of this, of this gas turns out to be zero, um, but of course there are tricks that I can play to help me understand why that magnetization might not be zero. But that doesn't, but those tricks don't help me to measure what is the magnitude, say, of this permanent magnetic dipole moment associated with any particular, uh, with any particular atom. And so you come up with a way to try to do this. You take some atom that has some electrical charge, right? And we need the electrical charge in order to do the following. We need to shoot it across the room, right? We need to shoot it from, uh, we need to shoot it at a screen so that we can, so that we can do a measurement. And so on the left-hand side over here, I have a capacitor. And that capacitor is going to allow me to shoot some, uh, some, some particles, some atoms across the room towards the right. Um, so, so when I have once I have those once I have those atoms moving, I can then try to measure their magnetic dipole moment by making those magnetic dipole moments interact with some sort of magnet. And so here in the middle, I'm going to have some I'm going to have some magnet. And notice it doesn't quite look symmetric, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's see, magnetic uh, field lines point from north to south, right? So, so these these atoms that I'm shooting out of my capacitor are going to head across this magnet. They're going to head in between the two poles of this magnet, and therefore they're going to interact with the, uh, they're going to interact with the magnetic field lines. They're going to interact with the magnetic field for a short period of time. And that hopefully will then allow, uh, allow, these, allow these atoms to be deflected, right? And so they'll show up on the screen on the right-hand side of the room uh, because, and they won't, they won't all hit the middle of the screen because they've been, they've been deflected by the, uh, by the magnet. Right? So how does a magnet actually deflect something with a permanent magnetic dipole moment? Well, we know that if I have a magnetic dipole moment in the presence of a magnetic field, there's an energy associated with that. And that energy is given by minus mu dot b, right? So if the, if the magnetic dipole moment and the magnetic field are aligned, that's a minimum of the magnetic, of the potential. If they're anti-aligned, then that's a then that's a mat that then that's a mat the maximum of the uh, of the of the energy of that of that system, okay. And if I have a potential energy, right, then I can start to then I can start to describe what the force might look like, right. 
if I, uh, if I have a, a potential energy, it gives me a conservative force. And that conservative force is given by minus the gradient of the potential energy. Isn't it wonderful how all of your physics courses are already coming into play in this, uh, in this final, you know, in this first lecture of quantum mechanics, right? So, um, so just to, to, to recap quickly, I have, uh, I have atoms shooting across the room. They, they get near this magnet. They're going to experience a force if there is a gradient of the potential energy that describes the interaction of the magnetic dipole moment and the magnetic field. Okay? So in order to get a force, I need to have a gradient of the potential energy. Well, if I look at the right-hand side of the expression for the magnetic potential energy, I see that it, it actually can be a little bit tricky to get a gradient, right? Because, well, one, um, as I say on the bottom here, if I have no if I have no other magnetic field, then I can expect there to be no other torques or forces on these atoms, right? And so the magnetic dipole moment is not only constant in magnitude, but it's constant in direction. Okay, so the force is proportional to minus the gradient of u. Now, I can't just take, I can't take this gradient and distribute it into my dot product, right? Because the dot product is a scalar, and that's something I can take the gradient of. But I can't just pull the mu out, right, and talk about taking the gradient of the field, right? So I'm going to have to do the dot product before I take the gradient. Luckily, the minus signs do cancel. But I have the gradient of uh, the x component of mu times the x component of b plus the y component of mu times the y component of b plus the z component of mu times the z component of b. And now in order for, in order for this thing then to be not zero, well, I, I, I just said we can't, we can't treat the, any component of mu as being uh, anything but a constant. Therefore, one of the components of b must not be a constant. And because of the way that I set up the system, right, I had a magnet that had a north and a south pole, right, and I had my magnetic field lines pointing downwards, right, it, the shape of this magnet is supposed to give us the impression that the magnetic field in between these two plates, in between the north and the south pole, is actually not a constant. And because everything in this problem seems to be happening in the z direction, what we'll do is we'll say that somehow we set this magnet up in such a way that the magnetic field is just about, you know, in the z direction, and therefore bz is the only one that exists. And these two terms go away because bx and by don't exist, but we'll also only allow the, the, the z component of the magnetic field to change in the z direction. And now this is a gradient that I can actually do. And I get that the force is then the z component of mu, which isn't surprising, right? Because the, the energy and therefore the force always relates to the dot product of the magnetic dipole moment in the magnetic field. But I get that it's, it's mu uh, times the derivative of bz with respect to z, right? Because I'm only allowing bz to change in the z direction, therefore the other two terms of, uh, of the gradient uh, vanish. Uh, I can't forget the z hat, right? But the force is going to have a magnitude given by mu z times dbz dz, that's kind of fun to say, um, in the z hat direction. And so it actually doesn't matter which direction I had those, um, I had my magnetic field lines uh, pointing. What matters when it comes to the force on this, on this magnetic dipole is where, how is it changing, right? How, what's the gradient of the magnetic field? And so it's going to be convenient then for me to say, let's, let's keep the, how we generated this magnetic field out of our minds for a minute, right? We trust the people that built the apparatus and we know that there's a magnetic field and that it has a gradient. And we're just going to say that they told us that the magnetic field gradient is positive, right? And therefore, uh, the, the db dz is positive. And if dbz db z dz is positive, and I've now labeled the z-axis on the left-hand side, 
we can make predictions of what's going to happen to different atoms as they pass through this magnetic field gradient, right? Because the force, or the magnitude, of the, let me just write it as the force, right, is going to be given by this particular quantity times that constant, that dbz dz, right, that the engineers told us would be there when they built us this apparatus. And so if the z component of the magnetic dipole moment is in the same direction as, or is positive, right, is in the same direction as the gradient of the magnetic field, then I get something that's positive, and the force is going to be upward. If I have a z component of the magnetic dipole moment that's negative, then the force is going to be downward, right? And so what really matters is the orientation of this magnetic dipole moment with the, um, with the, with the gradient of the, uh, the, the, the magnetic field. So the way I've drawn it here, I have, I have one atom, uh, which is going to give me, you know, that has, as I've drawn it, a positive component of the magnetic dipole moment in the z direction. And so that's going to give me a force upward. The one in the middle is going to give me no force, right, because there is no z component of the magnetic dipole moment. And the one down here well, um, and I shouldn't mix my notations, right? The one down here, because the z component is negative, my force is going to be downward, right? So I expect when my atoms come in that some of them are not going to be deflected, some of them are going to have a force upward, and some of them are going to have a force downward. And here's where the subtle statistics come in, right? And I've made this note on this slide in green to remind us that how much of them get deflected depends on how many ways can you have different orientations of the magnetic dipole moment. How I like to remind myself of this is, well, if the magnetic dipole moment is totally upward, there's only one way to get there. Or if it's totally downward, there's only one way to get there. But if I, if I rotate it upwards, well, now suddenly there is more than one way to get the same z component of the magnetic dipole moment. And in fact, the zero is the easiest one to get. There's sort of the most ways you can orient that atom such that it has a zero, uh, it has a zero z component. And so my prediction from classical physics, now I can put my screen over here, is that the majority of these atoms are going to be undeflected because there's a heck of a lot of ways to make the z component of the magnetic dipole moment zero. And some of them are going to be deflected more up until some, you know, maximum maximum value, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll put on a maximum and a minimum value here, and then there's going to be some uh, there's going to be some distribution, and this is probably something like a cosine squared, and I didn't draw it that way. It looks a little bit too Gaussian. Uh, the, the, the structure is what's important here, and maybe we'll go over the microphysics of it, uh, of the actual, what the actual structure looks like in class. But my prediction is that most of the atoms are going to end up in the middle, and then I'm going to be able to measure the magnitude of the z component, right? The maximum possible value of the magnitude of the z component is going to correspond to the atoms that just hit this top, right? And so if I know dbz dz, and I know where that zero is on the screen, well, then I can actually measure what the, what the, what the magnitude of the magnetic dipole moment is. Right? And that sounds like a great experiment to do if I want to know not just what the magnetization of my gas looks like, but what is the actual magnitude of the permanent magnetic dipole moment of one of these atoms. So then you set up the experiment, right? And you, you, take, your, you take your atoms and you shoot them through the, your capacitor. You have your magnetic fields that are set up by an engineer. You get your deflections and you expect, let me draw the expectation here, in red from, from what we, we calculated from classical physics. And of course, because you've already read your textbook, you know that this is not the answer. That, that somehow this distribution that I got from all of the wonderful statistics that I just did don't actually describe what the experimental outcome is. And when you, so when you do the experiment, you end up with one peak up here and one peak down here. And so in fact, the weirdest thing is that the place where I expected most of the atoms to end up, there are no atoms at all. Right? That the distribution of where of the values of the z component of the of the magnetic dipole moment are not distributed randomly. 
In fact, the values of the z component of the magnetic dipole moment appear to only have two possible values, right? There's the top bump and there's the bottom bump. And you're either in the top bump or you're in the bottom bump. And now these distributions, and I, you know, when you get the chance to do this experiment, they're, they're actually pretty narrow and they're Gaussian. And so there's, there's other effects that you have to take into play to, to understand why they're a little bit wider than just delta functions on the screen. But, but this, this experiment is not consistent with the random distribution of magnetic dipole moments. It's consistent with the explanation that there are only two possible measurements of the z component of the magnetic dipole moment. And that's really interesting, right? Because it's something that doesn't come from our classical understanding. And it's something that now seems to define a whole new set of parameters. It seems to tell us something about these, uh, about these atoms that they have some information or they have some, they have some state associated with them that was not accounted for in our classical description. So we can't say that the machine is broken, right? We, we trust the people that built it and the gradient of the magnetic field is something that we can actually test with a Hall probe or something if we wanted to. That, that part can't be wrong. And therefore, the thing that must be wrong is our interpretation of what it means to have a z component of the magnetic dipole moment, okay? And that, and that it's not continuously distributed. It's actually distributed uh, between two different values. And so <clears throat> mz, the z component, only has those two possible values. And somehow our device, right? I mean, so much of what determined those two values or determined this phenomenon was the existence of the device with a gradient in the magnetic field. And therefore, the device somehow was the thing that actually created the possibility to make these two measurements. That the device, and I'll use the word that we're going to use many times in this semester, somehow operated on the states, operated on the atoms, to arrange them in such a way that they, they acquired one of these two possible outcomes, okay? And so the device is really important here. But what also is really important here is the measurements themselves, right? That somehow passing through the device defined the possible measurements, but then making those measurements told us something about the individual atoms. So your take-home messages are that the stern gallic experiment showed that we can't measure mz, the z component of the magnetic dipole moment, to have just any value. And as we just said, that the device itself defines the possible outcomes, and that measuring means that you've, you've measured, that you've caused the atom, in this case, to have one of those possible outcomes. And this is the thing that sort of is, is a great place to start in our conversation of quantum mechanics, because what we see is a phenomenon that is not consistent with our classical picture. And it's also provided us with some, some framework, right, some, some language that starts to sound pretty familiar to us, right? If we wanted to come up with a new mathematical model to try to, dis to, try to describe this phenomenon, we do have, uh, we have mathematics that can help us to understand what it would mean, say, to have only two possible states, right? Um, and we'll talk more about that next time when we get into sort of the math and the nitty gritty of how are we going to develop a new mathematical model to describe this particular phenomenon. So I'll see you next time.